Hello and welcome to the Daily Climate Show. Coming up, we report from Antarctica where scientists are rebuilding the history of the oceans in a bid to help the future. On the brink of famine, hundreds die in the Horn of Africa as the worst droughts in four decades continues. And National Treasurer Sir David Attenborough receives his second knighthood to services for conservation. Welcome to The Daily Climate Show. We track the changes happening to our world, examine the impact those changes are having and hear from the people coming up with solutions. So almost three quarters of Britons believe our oceans need more protecting. That's according to a YouGov poll taken to mark World Ocean Day. Well, today, less than 8% of the world's oceans are protected, but scientists estimate that 30% of land and sea need to be protected by 2030 to create a healthy ocean and help stabilise the climate. In Antarctica, scientists are using cutting-edge DNA techniques to reconstruct the history of marine life before human interference. Sky science correspondent Thomas Moore filmed with them exclusively in Antarctica two years ago, where they were looking at the impact that industrial whaling had on the marine ecosystem. And we pick up the story on World Ocean Day as the first tantalising results start to come in. The skeletons of Deception Island's brutal past still scatter its beach. A hundred years ago, it was one of the most important whaling stations in Antarctica. The rusting pressure cookers turned thousands of tons of blubber into lamp oil. But the onshore stations couldn't compete with the arrival of industrial factory ships able to butcher and process whales out at sea. It allowed the fleets to plunder the oceans with brutal efficiency, with catastrophic consequences for Antarctica's giants. Now, scientists are trying to piece together the impact of the slaughter on the whole ecosystem. These are columns of mud lifted from the Antarctic seabed. They contain DNA signatures of life in the sea at the time, and the deeper in the mud they're buried, the further back they go. It's environmental history. A lot of the baleen whales are eating krill. Suddenly there's fewer whales, a smaller whale population. So that's going to have immediate impacts on the krill the zooplankton, and there'll be knock-on effects right the way through the ecosystem. And so we want to see if we can detect those changes before whaling started, to, to see what the situation was before whaling started. Two years on, and the scientists are back in their university labs, trawling through the DNA signatures. So far, they've found marine life in one Antarctic fjord crashed 30 to 40 years ago for as yet unknown reasons. And as they go back further in time, they should see the impact of whaling. The fact that we have um, a significant change, which has obviously occurred at a particular point in time, is a heartening result. It's showing that we're, we are uh, in, in, a, in a very sort of broad brush kind of way. We are able to reconstruct something meaningful about, about the, the ocean system. Since commercial whaling stopped in the 1980s, the population of some Antarctic species has begun to increase. But no one knows how many whales there should be. By reconstructing a healthy ocean, scientists will have a better idea whether marine conservation is anywhere near ambitious enough. Thomas Moore, Sky News. The world must widen its gaze from the war in Ukraine to prevent Somalia sliding into famine. That's uh, the message from the United Nations Children's Agency as the country suffers its most severe drought in more than 40 years. Now, four rainy seasons in a row have fouled in the Horn of Africa and experts predict a fifth below average season later this year. That's leaving millions facing severe hunger across the region. Now, drought is made more intense and more frequent by climate change and with food supplies being hit by the war in Ukraine, millions in the region are now at risk. Aid agencies say more than one and a half million children are malnourished and around three million livestock have died since last year due to drought and disease and that's just in Somalia. Many are having to walk long distances for medical care and are forced to leave vulnerable and sick family members behind. 
Brazilian police have opened a criminal investigation into the disappearance of a British environmental journalist in the Amazon. Dom Phillips and his guide Bruno Pereira were last seen on Sunday morning in an area known for violent conflict between fishermen, poachers and government agents. The journalist has written extensively about the threats facing the Amazon, including how cattle farming is fueling an environmental crisis and how illegal gold miners encroach on indigenous territory. Fossil fuel company Equinor has admitted to Sky News that it should be investing more money into renewable energy. The Norwegian oil giant spent around 8.6% of its capital expenditure on renewables in 2020, but plans to increase that to 30% in 2025. And 50% by 2030, Equinor plans to make the Humber the world's first net zero industrial region by 2040, with a hydrogen power project and a gas filled plant with carbon capture and storage both in the pipeline. Now, it was meant to be European Union's big solution, wasn't it, to the soaring energy prices, to reliance on Russian fossil fuels and to the climate crisis. But today, in a series of votes, MEPs rejected key parts of EU climate legislation known as Fit for 55. That's a package of measures aimed to reduce the bloc's greenhouse gas emissions by 55 per cent before 2030 and to accelerate the move before towards renewable energy. Well, our Europe correspondent Adam Parsons joins me now uh, from Brussels. So, Adam, tell us, why is this so important? It's important because the European Union is the third biggest uh, emitter in the world. Uh, it's also important because this is the, one of the real big policies that have been put forward by the European Commission, President Ursula von der Leyen. Uh, and she has really thrown her weight behind reforming European economies, making them greener, cutting emissions. European Commission has put forward its proposals and then, as is the way in this rather Byzantine structure you have here, they then get to go up to the European Parliament. Now, the expectation was that today these uh, would all go through in a marathon voting process, that the European Parliament would effectively rubber stamp these proposals uh, and that they would then go into the next stage, which is to be discussed by European Parliaments themselves. Well, that hasn't happened. Why? Well, because of a big political dispute between uh, effectively left-wing politicians, green MEPs uh, and uh, much more right-wing or indeed centre-right politicians who argued that these uh, emissions trading targets needed to be rethought, that they shouldn't be so extreme now because of the impact of hugely rising energy prices and also of the financial strain caused by the uh, war in Ukraine. They said they should be watered down. That slowly happened. And then, uh, I have to say, MEPs from, from the far left and far right decided, no, this had all gone too far and ripped up the proposals and threw them back to the committee, said we need something new, something that everyone can agree on. So what we effectively have is one group saying these need to be watered down, another one says we won't do it, and we are in a state of deadlock. The latest I have is that one person close to this deal said a deal could be, a, a revised deal might be done as soon as tomorrow, or it might take months. OK, Adam, thanks very much for that. And finally, Sir David Attenborough's been knighted for the second time. The broadcaster has been awarded the most distinguished order of St Michael and St George for services to television and to conservation. The Prince of Wales himself, a committed environmentalist, knighted the 96-year-old national treasure at an investiture ceremony at Windsor Castle. Well, that's all from us. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.